Hi, this is Jeffrey St. John, and you're listening to Retrospectives with John Broughton, celebrating 25 years on air on Casey Radio 97.7 FM. To kick off, we'll make it nice and easy for you. Was yours a musical household growing up? Um, yeah, yeah, it, it was. Uh wonderful absolutely wonderful uh, it was like growing up with um uh, nelson eddie and jeanette mcdonald as parents uh, because both of my parents had uh, beautiful voices um it's just that they weren't uh, psychologically equipped to make a career of it i don't think they ever envisioned making um, a career of it but we used to wander around the house uh, singing all the time Right. So was there a defining moment when you discovered you really had this amazing singing voice? Um, no, no, not not really. Um, it, it was just, it was there. Uh, I, family legend has it uh, that I was singing along with the radio at age 18 months. Um, and so it was just always there. Um, and of course, it, it was constantly reinforced because of... Um, uh, the way we used to sing around the house when we were doing housework and things. Um, and then uh, I would uh, get up and sing at school, um, for the school. And so, no, no, it was a gift that's been there from day one. Uh, tell us about the music scene as it was in Sydney when, when you were starting up there. Was was the competitive scene to get into? No, no well, not really for me. Um, I, I, I think this was all part of a master plan uh, myself. Uh, not that I'm a believer in absolute uh, fate or destiny because I believe that we can change our circumstance uh, dependent upon the decisions that we make. Uh, but having said that, there have been so many things that have occurred during my life over which I've had no control and I've made effectively no input um, and yet um, they've been wonderful things and getting into the live music thing uh, was one of those uh, because I was uh, heading off towards uh, the musicians club in Sydney um, and the bass player uh, although they weren't the id at the time they were the syndicate but he spotted me and they'd just lost their singer and he said, we're working down the York Club. Blah, come down. Come down and have a sing. And so it was as different as that. <laughs> um, and things just continued to happen uh, like that. Uh, we were offered um, the job at Australia's first true uh, discotheque, uh, purely out of the blue. Um, from that, uh, we did an unprecedented one-hour television special on Channel 7. Might have had something to do with the fact that one of the owners of the discotheque uh, was also a producer at Channel 7. <laughs> but having said that, it was an unprecedented thing uh, to happen to a band who didn't even have a recording contract at the time. Yeah. Um, and so that's really been the story of it. I, I mean, later on, um, I worked very hard um, to sustain my career um, and um, and that in the main was good uh, but um, as for starting no, my, my true start uh, was on television um, and that was on a Channel 9 program called Opportunity Knox mm -hmm. and I was a regular uh, on that program from age 15 to 17 um, and that gave me my television grounding and so consequently when all of these dear buffheads off the street were struggling to understand that you were supposed to look down the lens of the camera uh, I'd already gained all of that experience um, but um, as for the live scene now apart from uh, a, a few very uh, uh, very sporadic appearances uh, the live music thing didn't happen for me until the id hmm. the sound you had with the id was very much uh, soul and blues influence were they your first loves musically no no they took to that genre 
um, quite readily and and very much enjoyed it. Um, but I guess one of the things that I've been doing ever since uh, is um, I've been trying to break the stereotype. Yeah. Uh, and so consequently my musical career has been extremely diverse uh, since that time uh, and uh, I don't think there's a I think the only genre that I haven't really looked at is country and western <laughs> um, but apart from that I've managed to touch on a little bit pretty of much all the rest <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you recall the sessions that brought Big Time Operator do you remember feeling at the time that you had a hit on your hands oh absolutely Ab- absolutely um Operator, I think, was about our third or fourth record. Um, all the rest stiffed, unfortunately. But uh, I mean, having said that, uh, at that point, we hadn't really been captured on vinyl. Mm. Um, but um, there was a big shake-up in the company, and we were given Pat Alton as a producer and while I was in hospital doing one of those interminable tours of duty that uh, plagued my life um, our manager of the time Dale Miles brought that track into me in hospital and said look you've got to do this song if you don't do it then the guitar player is going to do it but whatever happens the band has to do it because it's a hit yeah um and i said well i wouldn't mind a hit thank you (laughs) um and so we did it and alton not only captured the essence of the band but in my opinion um i certainly at the time um it was the first record that I'd ever heard, regardless of the fact that we did it. It was the first Australian record that I had ever heard that didn't sound like it had been produced in Australia. Mm-hmm. It sounded like it could have been produced in the States. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, that was the magic of Patrick, um, but it was also part of what we brought uh, to the process. Yeah. No, it sounded like it could have come straight out of the Stack Studios or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, we, it, it captured what we were doing um, beautifully, um, but we didn't sound like an Australian band either um, at that stage. We, uh, in fact, I, it was it was quite funny um, because I was talking to uh, one of the boys. I can't remember which one it was, but when we did the the Roy Orbison Yardbirds show at the Sydney Stadium Um, I was just chatting to one of the English fellas and uh, might have even been Jimmy Page uh, because we hooked up for a little while Um, but um, he said to me you know when are you coming to England and I said to him when we're ready and he said what are you waiting for (laughs) 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 and of course being a being an extremely green and naive 19, 20 year old uh, I was extremely flattered <laughs> um, it still took me f- five years I think to, to get over there after that but that was my perception mm. um, I didn't really have um, uh, a perception of, uh, of how good we were um, but there you go So what prompted you to, to leave the id when you did and form your next band? Um, just musical differences. Yep. The, the boys wanted to regress. Uh, we were having great difficulty keeping quality horn players in the outfit. Um, and um, the last horn section that we had uh, were lovely people, um, but they didn't really inspire me or the rest of the band. Uh, and so consequently, the boys wanted to regress and go back to... Uh, our the ids and my musical roots as a corporate thing um and i didn't want to go backwards uh-huh. um, i oh, i genuinely hate uh retrospectives <laughs> <laughs> there we go um but um no, no my from my earliest earliest memories um it's been instilled in me that um, that forward is the way to go yeah and um 
part of my philosophy is that um, I'll continue learning until uh, the day that I die. Uh, and the day that I die, I'll learn the answer to the biggest question in my mind. Uh, but uh, that that's, I mean, that that's the way that I, I need to grow. And um, even with all the chaos and calamity that um, has occurred throughout my life, uh, I'm still growing. Yeah. Now, I read somewhere about uh, when you found that you were going to be in a, in a wheelchair from, from that point on, that it actually changed everything for you as far as your, your stage persona goes. Well, the, the, the irony there is that I made the decision to actually go into a chair, uh, but that decision was based on information that I got when I was over here in Perth having some body work done. Mm hmm uh, and um, it was suggested to me very strongly then that I would eventually end up in a wheelchair. Um, when I flew back to Sydney, I thought long and hard about it. Uh, and it occurred to me that I would probably be much more functional in a wheelchair because the, the downside of, uh, of functioning on crutches is that your hands are always full. Yeah. Um, and so when I really thought about it pragmatically, um, it made huge amounts of sense. And so I went into a standard wheelchair um, and used a standard wheelchair for probably 12 months um, until I thought my way through the inherent problems that existed for me being in a standard chair, uh, one of which was the compression of the diaphragm, uh, and the other was the visual aesthetic on stage, mm -hmm. um, because I looked like an animated garden gnome. <laughs> um, and so that's when I designed the tall chair, um, and I've used tall chairs ever since. Um, they, they suit my lifestyle. Um, and um, the way that I set them up, my diaphragm is completely liberated, um, and there's not that that startling visual dropout um, that occurs. Yeah. Um, so it's a, a great help, but that's how it all came about. It was my decision. But at that stage, I was fighting an ongoing battle with a very, very serious wound on my right buttock uh, that eventually put me in hospital um, and after three months of wasted time uh, none of the uh, surgeons in Macquarie Street could do anything about it and they effectively wrote me off uh, but that's another story again um, but while I was there a guitar player friend of mine uh, contacted me from Perth and said, look, you've got to come to Perth. The streets are paved with gold. Um, we'll clean up. And so I contacted my drummer out of Yama. Um, he, in turn, dug up uh, Barry Kelly, the keyboard player, and uh, we all emigrated over here to Perth. And that's where Copper Wine was born. Mm -hmm. This was, of course, after I checked out of hospital. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, that's how it came to be and the ultimate value of it was that the band itself uh, was able to get its act together um, without the glare of publicity which uh, tended to happen with me at, those, at that stage if I started a new project the press were all over it and so the expectations from day one were extraordinarily high. Mm. And it doesn't work like that in a gestalt. Um, a gestalt takes time to develop. Um, and so we were lucky enough to be able to do that while we were here in Perth, just slogging around the traps like the rest of the uh, boys. So by the time we got back to Sydney, uh, we were well fleshed. Talk about the joint effort album. Was it disappointing at the time that it didn't receive as much recognition as it should have? It's probably an album ahead of its time. Um, yeah, uh, it, it it was rather because uh, 
it um, in a lot of ways, certainly in a lot of the production techniques uh, that uh, that were used, extremely avant garde. Um, but that was another example of uh, how my diversity. Um, has tended to work against me in some small regard, I think, um, because I stole a reviewer's quote uh, from the Joint Effort album and used it as the title of my new album. <laughs> uh, and the, at the end of the review, where uh, the reviewer said, yeah, I really like it. I, uh, there's not a bad track on it, but will the real Jeff St. John please stand up? <laughs> And I thought, that's too good to waste. I'll just <laughs> pop that in the file. And um, now that we have the uh, the new CD going, uh, that's the title of the new CD. And uh, I couldn't think of a more appropriate title, <laughs> given um, what the new CD contain contains. <laughs> so you got them back. <laughs> I got them back. <laughs> but it was a good review. I, uh, mm. And the um, the silly part about that, album um, was the fact that we sold 2,000 copies in the first week. I mean, it, it threatened to be an absolute monster. Um, but um, due to some really, really aberrant thinking um, that I, well, that I went along with, um, that I definitely wouldn't uh, today, but um, it was decided that... <coughs> pardon me, because of what the Beatles had done with Sergeant Pepper and the like, uh, there was a, a very clear distinction between uh, recorded product and live product. And so consequently, we didn't do any of the album material on no, stage, no. and that didn't help. No. Um, but uh, having said that, I mean, I, I, I didn't resist the decision um, particularly at the time, um, I should have, and I should have insisted. Um, but then again, that was then, and this is now. That's right. And this is this is why I no longer belong to a musical democracy. <laughs> I'm the most benevolent despot you could ever meet, but, <laughs> but a despot I am. What about when when Wendy Saddington joined the band? Did that change the band much for you? Suddenly, not being the sole. Upfront vocalist. Um, yeah, yeah, it expanded it wonderfully for me um, because Wendy is such a very, very special person and um, such an extraordinary voice um, that it was all uh, wonderfully exciting. Uh, the The problem was that uh, cracks were already starting to appear in. Um, in the union um, even before Wendy joined mm -hmm. um, and so it was an attempt to revitalise uh, the the whole thing um, but I mean it made about as much sense as parents staying together for the sake of the kids yeah. um, and so it didn't work you, you kept up a massive touring schedule didn't you during that time well that's always been part of my priority uh, and and now in, with the impeccable 2020 hindsight that we all have um, what I should have been doing is spending a lot more time in the recording studio mm. um, but uh, the the instant gratification of live performance is something that really really is an extraordinary drug when you get it right and you finish the song and people respond immediately, um, this is a drug. Yeah. And quite a wonderful drug, I might say. Um, better than anything else. <laughs> um, but so that uh, that's where that came from. Now, in later years, you had the distinction of being the first Australian to sign with Asylum Records. How did that all come together? Uh, well, again, that... Uh, that was just another gift from God. Uh, I'd found a fool in love, and I'd put it aside um, because I knew that it would work. Um, and 
I was thinking about shopping uh, for a deal and David Sinclair out of the blue approached me because he'd just become the A&R man for Warner Brothers here in Australia and that was part of David's uh, offer uh-huh. uh, to get me to sign with Warner's the fact that I would be the first person outside of the US to be released on the asylum label um, and so that was an interesting interesting process um, I think Warner's to some small degree shot themselves in the foot a little um, because when the album which again due to hospitalisation didn't follow the single immediately it it was 12 months after before we got the album into the shops Um, but it didn't work uh, in the shops Uh, it didn't get enough radio support but that was I think in part due to the fact that we'd produced an FM product before FM existed (laughs) and so that didn't help Um, but um, having having said that um, when it didn't move immediately Warner's deleted it from the catalogue whereas my association with festival has been far more in, in keeping with my philosophy of in regard to anything that I do I I hate uh, the disposable mentality that society is suffering from um, particularly these days and so anything that I attempt I believe is going to last that's the way that I fabricate things for my mm. motorcycle that's the way that I do things in general um, and festival agreed with me um, because uh, they've had uh, the uh, Survivor compilation album uh, on the books uh, for nearly 30 years you can still buy it now Um, all you have to do is order it um, but it's always part of it's been part of the catalogue for nearly 30 years so uh, I think that was the deal with Warner Brothers Mm -hmm. Now, when you um, when you announced your retirement from music in the eighties, was that something that had been brewing for a while? Well, that that was a bit of a misquote. I I announced my retirement from live performance. Okay. Um, uh, just to clarify, uh, for people who might be listening, um, the first thing I did after I retired was went home and finished my recording studio. So, <laughs> and then spent. Um, the next five years uh, with my songwriting collaborator uh, uh, producing a catalogue of three CDs full of original material. Um, So that was the priority there. But the the other more obvious aspect of the retirement was that I woke up one morning and realised that I was no longer a gypsy I really um, had ceased to enjoy the travel um, the way that I used to. Um, But I also realised that music was all that I'd ever done and I had absolutely no idea what else I could do. Um, And uh, because of the nature of the business, uh, unless you get very, very lucky like John Farnham um, or whatever, um, when you're a full-time musician, that's all you do. That's all you really have time to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so I had to find out, quite simply, what else I could do. Um, thankfully, I've discovered that I can do a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> um, I became... Um, a social educator for North Shore Hospital Um, and even though that in itself was still performance um, I ended up being I ended up instigating and becoming responsible for their annual media uh, campaigns which meant that I was writing radio ads television ads producing them um, directing them um, 
I, I was designing teaching aids, uh, some of which ended up being used uh, by the head of our program, um, the lovely Dr. John Yeo, um, to teach uh, uh, trainee doctors, uh, in fact. Uh, and, and in that, during that uh, period of time, I also headed an R&D team at uh, the University of New South Wales, uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, which is not bad for a kid who didn't finish second year. <laughs> bad at uh, all. <laughs> uh, and, and so uh, uh, that's where those rewards came from. Uh, I discovered that, uh, yes, in fact, I could do other things, uh, and in fact, I wasn't bad at other things as well. Um, and so it was a vital thing for me to do as a person. So, so moving up to more recent times, what were the circumstances that led you to uh, getting back up on stage again? <laughs> <laughs> I, I should have uh, I should have sent you the press releases I wrote for the local newspapers. <laughs> uh, but uh, there you go. I, well, I followed um, the love of my life over here to Perth. Uh, a family tragedy brought her over here. Um, and when I looked at the phone bill, it was either pay the phone bill or sell everything and move. Yeah. And so, uh, of course, it was sell everything and move. Uh, but I had no intention of performing. Um, and then a drummer friend of mine just turned up unannounced at the front door and said, look, there's nothing happening in town. I'm going crazy. Come and make something happen. Um, and uh, I thought, yeah... Yeah, that could be good. Let's let's see uh, let's see what we can do. Um, and so I said to him, "Yes, I'm I'm interested, but I'm really only interested uh, if we pursue this musical concept that um, I've had in my head for a number of years. That was was proven briefly in Sydney, um, although I didn't pursue it." Uh, with my usual passion um, but that was to take material from people like Gershwin and uh, Rogers and Hammerstein and Irving Berlin and all of those wonderful big band things from the 30s and 40s and, uh, and uh, have it played by a rock band and anyway the, the long and the short of it uh, is that uh, we found the appropriate people um, I sold the concept to a pub owner in Fremantle who hired us for a four-week season and um, the season finished 78 weeks later. <laughs> uh, so, uh, there was um, a demand there, obviously. So, so <laughs> the embers were born. Yeah. And in, in fact, um, the embers still exist and um, we don't work a lot at the moment but part of that's due to my body uh, but uh, God keeps blessing me because this year um, we're flying to Munich uh, to do um, the International Spinal Conference Gala Ball Oh wow! Um, and um, we're in fact flying out September 30 to do uh, that, um, that very job Fantastic, and I mean that. People wonder why my faith is so strong, um, but my life is absolutely littered with these small miracles. <laughs> and I often say to people, the only prob the, the only problem that you have with your faith is recognizing a miracle when it happens. <laughs> um, and um, thankfully, I recognize them, large or small. Um, so there you go. So, with these, would this be the one that probably best represents wh where you've always been at musically? Um, no, that that kind of statement uh, is rather too pointed because they've all represented where I've been yeah. at any given time. But this particular band um, is really the first band where I've been able to be as diverse 
uh-huh. as I need to be to sustain my own interest. Um, because there's virtually nothing that this band can't play. Um, and um, that, to me, is, um, is where it's at. Uh, uh, Ray Charles made the very astute observation that there's only two kinds of music and that's good and bad (laughs) and I don't do bad music (laughs) but good music has no boundaries it has no genre Um, good music is simply good music doesn't matter whether it's Tammy Wynette or uh, ACDC and my uh, own music collection was as broad as that Yeah, everything from Brahms to the Beatles and all points in between. So the lights that you do with the embers, is it pretty much all this type of material or, or do you um, step back into your own back catalogue from time to time? Um, yeah, not much. Not much. I, uh, it, <laughs> I, I guess you could, you could be forgiven for thinking that the embers thing was a backward step, but it wasn't really because nobody has approached the music in this particular fashion before, no. even though the music was written a hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody has approached the music um, in this particular fashion before, uh, and so consequently, it's another step forward. And um, I'm pleased to say that. Uh, the way we've managed to capture it on the CD, it sounds like some of this stuff could have been written yesterday. Um, and um, That pleases me enormously. But the show that I wrote um, for the band is a two-hour show. Um, the first hour is all of that wonderful schmooze stuff. Um, but the second hour is, oh, I guess, rock and roll from the 50s to the 70s but a lot of the stuff uh, that I didn't or couldn't do Uh um, way back when it was popular uh, because it didn't fit uh, the um, outfits that I was with or that I was using at the time Um, and so it's still refreshing but we we still I I still um, out of deference uh, to the people who come and see us uh, perform the hits yeah um if they want if they don't want then that's fine i'll give them something markedly more (laughs) diverse uh but uh i mean anybody who denies uh their roots like that um i don't really have any time for yeah yeah I, i think it's stupid but so we do that. That's what we do. One thing I wanted to ask you about before I let you go, the, the opening ceremony for the Paralympics, that must have been a special moment for you. In front of 100,000, 110,000 people. Yeah. It's, <laughs> uh, the, that was another gift from God. A gift from God and Michael Chug. Uh, and, that's, and that's almost an oxymoron. Uh, but, <laughs> but there you go. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that was an extraordinary thing to be involved in. Um, I, I would never have expected that kind of gift. Um, but having said that, um, it was just wonderful. Yeah, must have been. And uh, what's happening for you after the, the German trip? Anybody, what's, what's in the books there? Um, I don't have any musical plans um, at the moment. Uh, at, at the moment, I'm extremely busy being uh, the patron of uh, a local uh, service provider organisation um, called Mosaic community care Mm -hmm. and I'm the patron of that um, organisation but um, there's also been um, pointed interest expressed in the little commuter trike that um, I worked on with the university uh, way back then Uh, and um, so at this point in time most of my energies are going towards generating the money to actually get the prototype built Uh, and we'll see where that takes us but having said that um, 
music is once again a, a very much uh, a part of my life and um, unlike um, the uh, crazy years um, it's not being denied yeah uh, and so it, it's just a matter of wait and see at this stage <laughs> what I'm hoping is that um, if we get a chance to be seen by the right people in Germany that I may spend my dotage cruising around the smoke-filled cabaret rooms <laughs> of Europe uh, but um, at this stage there's absolutely nothing planned no. well just the same it's fantastic to, to hear you're, um, you're making music again and performing again oh mate thank you very much for that and uh, thanks so much for one of the uh, one of the great musically diverse careers of the, in Australian music oh that, that's a very nice thing to say John <laughs> thank you very much and I mean that I mean that sincerely all the best thanks for your time Jeffrey good luck over in Germany hope it goes really well for you well, mate just uh, Tell them all about the new CD. Oh, that, that, we have to do this. Um, if people uh, want to order the CD, mm -hmm. all they have to do is go to our website, which is Jeffrey St. John and the Embers. Dot com. The, dot I I net dot net dot au. Ah. Um, but, uh, having said that, if you just type Jeffrey St. John and the Embers, all one word, into your search engine, Up she um, comes. it'll find us. Yeah, no problem at and, all. And so if they want to order the new product, they can just order it directly through there. And my lovely sound man who babysits our website um, will make sure that um, the uh, order is fulfilled. Fantastic. All right, mate. Look, okay. thanks, for, thanks for your time, too. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. All the best. Bye, John. Take care.